shine here at all today. It's pretty dark, actually, dark and gloomy a little bit here. Yeah, it's been, it's been dark, sometimes a bit sunny, then it rained, but it's still really humid, so we're getting there, slowly but surely, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great day. It's a great it's day. <laughs> A solidly great day. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. Um, well, how is the weather where you all are coming from to our Twitch users and viewers? We want to say a big hello and welcome to all who are viewing. Welcome to the Argon AI live stream on Twitch. My name is Paula and I'll be your host today. I am joined by the lovely Lauren and the lovely Jess. Hello. We're excited to have you here. If you are just tuning in for the first time, hello, we are Argon. Um, we are an artificial intelligence company. And uh, if you would like to learn more about who we are, some services we provide, and you know a little bit more about um, how AI can change your world for the better, um, head on over to argon.com, A-R-G-H-O-N.com. You can catch us on our Twitch channel, or you can catch us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Argon AI. That is A-R-G-H-O-N-A-I. We also have an informational and also lots of fun videos on our YouTube channel. That is youtube.com forward slash Argon. Yes, yes, yes. Um, how we typically start the show is we start off with a random question of the day. Ladies, do either of you have a random question of the day? Um, oh, yes, I, yeah, okay, I have one. Maybe I spoke too soon. No, I can have one with one. Um, if you, this is a, which one would you rather? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Would you rather have to write um, a million times over, literally a million times over, um, you know, I will not talk in class or um, have to hand carve uh, the statue of David. You know, like the actual David statue, but like a yeah. duplicate, but like in marble. Which one would you rather do? Oh my gosh. You know I don't like to make these easy. No. Both are gonna kill <laughs> my body. Um, I don't know if I have the skill to do the statue, so I think I've got to go with the, the writing. A million times. It's going to hurt. It's really going to hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, a million times, I mean, your hand is shot either way. You really look yeah. at it. Yeah. You're carving some, the, the, the statue of David, um, your hands are still pretty shot. But there was no timeline stipulated on this, and you know I always Don't love say that. <laughs> I love to look for a loophole. There's no timeline on this. So, you know what? I'm going to try my hand literally at carving the Statue oh. of David. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little artistic, uh, artistic thing to do. It's something to keep me busy uh, during this time of quarantine. I, I think, uh, yeah, to, to carve the Statue of David would actually be pretty fun to learn. Um, I, I and what if what if they both had the same time limit like a week for one a week for the other or whatever yeah. if it's a month it's a month but it's like the same they both have to be done in the same time frame I'm gonna carve because also not stipulated in the question was how big this had to be mm -hmm. so if it's just a pretty nice size no but then it's more detail though Kit of the Statue of David. I didn't say it's a miniature. It, it's I didn't say that. It doesn't have to be the same size because that was now stupid. No, no. I said duplicating the Statue of David. Duplicating. I didn't say like just a yeah. small. No. So <laughs> Paula's like, size yeah. Is size is the same, Paula. No. That's, that's too much of 
Yes, so, same size. You are just doing the Statue of David. How long, how long is this time limit? Whatever the time limit is, it's just the same for both. Okay, all right, so let's, let's say a month. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do, I'll carve, I'll carve, I'll carve David. Yeah. I think actually yeah. it'd be fun. I, I like, I like trying, trying my hand at new artistic pursuits, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay. if it's still a month, I'm still gonna go with writing because then I know at least I can spread it out over like <laughs> you know a certain amount of days and um, plus I feel like even if it was you know a smaller statue which it's not I know but I feel like that's even like harder because then it's smaller you got to be really like Remember, it's intricate like I emphasize yeah. it's the same, same statue of David like yeah I'm, I just don't trust myself. I feel like if you, you go wrong, you have to start again. So that's just my added thing that I'm putting in. So I just feel like I would mess up too many times where I know that I can write, even though it will hurt, I can spread it out over a month. So yeah, yeah. both of our hands are just going to be like, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great random question. What would you choose, Lauren? I'd write because um, there's too many instances when you're hammering stone where you can accidentally hammer your hand. Um, oh. And my hands are necessary for my life. Um, so I'm not willing to put up with potentially breaking my own fingers by accident. That's fair. That's fair enough. I know your, your hand modeling career might just be done. Over. I mean, done. I have insurance on them for a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> love that i love it <laughs> oh my gosh uh to uh, to our twitch users and viewers at home right now which would you choose ask around ask your friends ask your family and while you're at it um have them tune in as well get in on the conversation that we are having today today is throwback thursday and um and our subject this week, our topic is um, print, print journalism. So print journalism obviously has a very rich and varied history. I'm going to be going through the history in the United States, what that looked like, carve a little idea for, for everyone at home just to get an idea of, um, of what it looked like back in the day, how it currently is, and what a future imagined with artificial intelligence in the subject of, of print media, print journalism uh, will be for the future. Okay, ladies, are we ready to get started? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, um, I would like to give a big uh, thank you to thoughtco.com for an informational lesson that, you know, I had to brush up on knowledge and uh, I used this website to help me brush up on knowledge. All right, <laughs> credit where credit is due, right? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, so it all dates back to around 1690. Um, the first, the first origins of of printing, the press, and 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 writing anything uh, dates back to uh, typewriters in terms of things that can be used to, to produce in bigger numbers than just for personal use. Even though obviously a typewriter, you can only do one page at a time, one letter at a time, and it is very time consuming. This was the first way uh, in which people were, were using the idea of a newspaper, the first ideas of what that looked like. Obviously it wasn't multiple uh, pages like you would say newspapers are typically now up to what like six to ten pages it wasn't as uh, huge of a thing or or super built out but uh, typewriters was the the main mode of, of writing back in the day so newspapers printing news articles for humans to consume any any idea that you would have liked to have seen in the in the newspapers were written. So uh, the earliest days of who was writing the papers, it was more of their opinions on on said subjects. It wasn't necessarily what you would think of as 
investigative journalism. It was more, okay, I'm going to write about this person. And I'm going to let you know how I feel about said topic or issue or person. And, and that was the way um, originally uh, print journalism was. The, the subjects of things, it was, it was varied, but it was more coming from the, the writer's point of view and specifically their, per, their perspective. And any ideologies that they had, they were letting you know that that is what they felt. And that was, that was the slant that the stories were taking as opposed to an unbiased stance. It was very, uh, very opinionated, sprinkled in with uh, this is what's going on, but you also knew where, where they stood on issues. All right as opposed to sticking to what you would think of as modern day journalistic integrity. And you will see further along into the years where that comes into play. Um, right now uh, in the creation of things around the year 1690, it is still very much up to whomever is writing. All right, so we are going throughout history and in 1735, there was, there was, um, there was a trial about a certain article that was produced about someone. And the things that were written about the person, um, Peter Zenger, actually, he was the publisher of the New York Weekly Journal article. And he was arrested and put on trial because what he was saying about uh, someone uh, pertaining to the British government, you know, it was, it was, you know, crazy, and it was on that that level of libel, he would say. Um, but in 1735, they actually came out with the ruling from that case that no matter how scandalous, no matter how crazy it is, uh, what they are saying, as long as it is factual, based on the truth, and there is evidence to back it up that obviously this is truth that is being said. It was actually he was released. From, from jail and he was found not guilty because uh, that level of journalistic integrity was still there, although it was a very, you know, disgracing article. It was something of, well, he's actually telling the truth and this is his opinion based on factual evidence. So we're going to let him go. Uh, that was one of the first uh, ideas of, uh, libel and what that means for print journalism and, and the media and, and uh, print media specifically. It was a landmark case, helped uh, establish the foundation of a free press as well. So you can write about anything as long as it is now having some semblance of truth and, and factual. So it even changed from the 1690 to 1790. 1735 that having to be based within the truth as opposed to just your opinions. Okay. In the 1800s, we are moving along now. Um, 1800s is kind of uh, where you are seeing uh, business people having the, the access to papers, you know, on the way to work, it's something kind of casual, you can you can kind of grab and go. Uh, during this time also is the creation of the steam, steam powered printing press um, around this time. So in the 1800s, brought a lot of technological advances in a way to mass produce things. Um, and it made it more easily accessible to people. Um, the 1800s uh, also brought along uh, times of war. So the Civil War, um, the idea of receiving information about times of war. So you are not in the war and you're not obviously typing stories from war. So using a, a telegraph to, to tell your stories and those stories are then printed um, to, to you know, your homeland of what is actually going on during war. So this is uh, the first instance of actually seeing real time views of, of what war looked like in the printed press. Um, in the newspapers that were produced around this time, you see the, 
the traditional form of how newspapers are printed today. Uh, they do it in the inverted triangle. A lot of the most important information at the bottom and it kind of, you know, it's kind of broad and general at the top. Although it's the most important, they kind of fluff it out and then towards the bottom it gets more specific and uh, right to the point. So it, it's, it's the inverted triangle um, styling of, of writing you are seeing during the Civil War and, and the reporting on that. Okay. During this time, you also saw the, the starting of the Associated Press. Um, a lot of big press organizations coming together to uh, share the news as opposed to it being like, well, they only report this thing and we only report that thing. It was more of a, okay, well, under the Associated Press, this is the, the news of America. This is what the current events are. So let's all make sure we are getting the proper information out to the public, no matter what, what news uh, source it specifically is. Just make sure it's factual and make sure that the people are getting their news correctly. All right, we are moving right along. Um, as, as the years are progressing, you are seeing a differentiation in the types of print journalism that are produced. So uh, they, they are marketing, they, print media, is marketing towards uh, different kinds of people. So you have the business people who are on the street and they're just grabbing newspapers. And then you have uh, more highly esteemed newspapers coming up during this time. Um, uh, one of the most famous ones is the New York Times, that that was one of the first major highly esteemed uh, print media sources in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the way that print media was being consumed was changing as opposed to it being for few, it is now for everyone. Um, how you are absorbing your news, everyone is absorbing the news. So it's not so much word of mouth anymore, it's more, yes, I read that as well, or yes, I read this here. Um, everyone is able to easily access um, sources of print as we are moving through history. All right, along, along the times of uh, the emergence of highly esteemed printing news outlets, you are seeing the emergence of um, investigative journalism. So investigative journalism is, you know, investi investigating a topic or a person and coming with hard hitting facts. There's a lot of research involved in this type of journalism. Um, it's not so much uh, current events, but it is saying, okay, well, I've done months of research on a said topic and I'm going to publish uh, an expose or you know, whatever that looked like for the, the, the investigative journalist, uh, you are seeing uh, big pieces being printed. Um, it's not so much just current events, it is actually specific topics coming from an unbiased approach, but, but giving uh, the readers all of the information needed to, to make educational, you know, opinions of their own. Investigative journalism, Ooh. which is uh, something you, we see a lot in modern day mm -hmm. and in current day, the way the press, press is consumed. Um, what is very funny in the research of all of this is how we see in, in a lot of the past episodes of Throwback Thursday, we see, I mean, even speaking about um, music last week and the, the clubbing experience, how it was one thing, how it first came out, and then it kind of morphed into something towards the middle. And then current day, it's kind of get, trying to get back to, to yes. the origins yes. of where it started. Um, current day, journalism, print media, uh, there, there is now an introduction to all different sorts of ways uh, people come across and consume their media, whether it be radio, internet, uh, and, and, and the different kinds of articles that are associated with how you are um, digesting or taking in the information. It can be through a blog, it could be through a website, it could be through a third party 
um, source that that although not explicitly uh, pro or against certain ideals, um, they are still associated with uh, certain types of leaning in journalism. Um, there, there's just really so much access to all different kinds of information today. Um, because there are so many different outlets in which you can consume your media and the way you, you receive your news stories, um, the idea of print journalism specifically has, has been on the decline. Mm -hmm. So the idea of actually printing on paper is something that is not as popular as it once was, uh, just because everything is so easy now. By the touch of our fingertips, we have uh, a whole weeks, months, years past of, of news articles. You know, there are specific stations on the radio or, you know, internet, uh, internet radio that you can literally listen to any kind of news that you are trying to find nonstop throughout the day. Um, because of that, that you have seen a decline in the actual print journalism um, space. A lot of those print journalism um, so news sources that we've seen in the past, they are still here today, and they are still, you know, highly esteemed. The thing is, is that everyone has moved over now to an internet format. So they are still printing and producing the physical paper, just not as much as it was in the past. Um, because like with the time, things change and you have to acclimate, you know, uh, the, the idea of conserving uh, is something that is on the minds of even the people who consume the new stories. So, so choosing the online method is, you know, some people find it a more responsible uh, option than just consuming newspaper that you're probably only going to read once or twice mm -hmm. and discard. Um, yes, you are seeing a mixture of op pieces, so opinions, which is the origins of print journalism. You are seeing a specific area dedicated to people's opinions and what they think about said topics of the time. Um, that is something that still has a lot of value and weight to um, how we consume and how we think of news and current events today. Um, you are also seeing a lot of investigative journalism as well today that is a, a very uh, popular uh, forte to, to delve into in regards to print media and print journalism. Uh, you are also seeing with the emergence of blogging and you know having the accessibility to create your own websites, you are also seeing a lot of people's personal opinions and, and um, outside of the space of, of an op piece, just people's personal opinions on, on whatever they are wanting to speak about, you are seeing the emergence of that. Um, where it is different from how it used to be to current day is that you know a lot of news sources are being called news sources, although it could just be someone's personal blog mm -hmm. and, and it looks official. A lot of things uh, are, are deceiving now, current day, just because you know a lot of things look more official than possibly they are, and people are taking them as truth. Um, where I am seeing current day that I appreciate, there, there are a lot of different opinions out there, but um, I do believe that the idea of journalistic integrity is something that is still <sighs> trying to be held on to. <laughs> by the grips of our fingertips, you know. Um, there is a lot of news out there and uh, there are a lot of things to consume right now, but there are also on the other end, there are people who are still dedicated to the idea of making sure, you know, articles are fact-checked and, and that is a whole other, that is a whole other, you know, sub-topic of the idea of print and media journalism today is, is that is something that has to be um, done. So this is not, the idea of fact checking and making sure and vetting your you know, uh, resources is not something that was just happening during current day. Uh, with the emergence of investigative journalism, going back just a little bit, 
um, investigative journalism had to deal a lot with, um, it was very politicized when it first came to be of, of popularity. Um, I think one of the first times we saw in, in media that the printing of investigative journalism was around um, the Nixon White House and, and everything that went on with the Watergate scandal. Um, it, it was something that, you know, having to check your facts and make sure that you are delivering the, the truth of what everything is going on during a time is, is, um, is something that had its, its origins around that time. And as the years progress now, back to current day, uh, you see that with investigative journalism, uh, I, I do see that as, as something that, you know, the truth and the facts have to be there. And then you let people decide for themselves what it is going to be personally. You know, um, investigative journalism deals in the facts. And um, I, I appreciate a, an investigative journalism piece personally. But yeah, so this is, this is a short little history of... Um, of journalism, print media uh, in the United States. Um, because, because everything has moved online, uh, the idea of the paper, it's, it's not something as it used to be, but the same ideas and, and the same articles are, are still being written to this day. You know, uh, it's, just, it's just how we choose to consume said topics, um, which I think is very interesting because because the idea of people always wanting information in it to be information that is correct is something that will, will never stop. People will always look for knowledge and people will always look for what is going on and you know, just wanting sources that are factual and, and can give you the facts as it is. Now, this is current day and you know, nothing is perfect. Nothing, no, no topics we have is perfect. And it's, you know, it's always some, some things about it will be flawed. Um, but uh, what, what I find so interesting about journalism and, and how it will, well, we're also going to be talking about the future of that is that with the emergence of the internet and uh, having information really quickly accessible and not just accessible to certain types of people, but really accessible to everyone on a global mm -hmm. scale, easily, readily, readily available, um, is something that I see as a great um, opportunity to make sure that what is being consumed and you know absorbed into our brains be something that is actually factual and and upholds the journalistic integrity that once was a standard. Um, I, I do believe that now. We, we have seen how that has changed throughout history. And um, obviously different countries, it's, it's different and, and what, what that looks like. But um, in the US, I think right now we, we live in a time where there's a great opportunity to be able to uh, see what is true and not true for ourselves. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I, think, I think because Currently, there are so many different kinds of stories out there. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to really seek out what is true for ourselves. And I do believe that technology, artificial intelligence specifically, will aid in, in the next, uh, the next uh, season and, and the next um, shift in um, print media and journalistic um, media, how, how we are consuming the news. So ladies, what do you think about print media in the US? Jess, I'm sure it, it might be different in the UK, but I mean, what are you thinking about just the progression throughout history? Mm, I mean, it is, yeah, it's pretty funny that at the start it was sort of very opinionated. I mean, as many <laughs> news outlets now say that they don't have a bias, I think a lot of companies definitely do have a certain bias. But again, it sort of goes back to that fact where it moved on. So as long as there was actual fact in it, they could still kind of, you know, put it out as a story. So I think that's really interesting. Um, obviously, I can't really comment too much on the US side of things because I'm in the UK. Um, so I'll kind of speak from the UK side of things of what I notice. 
Um, and I guess it's kind of similar the fact that we all live in the age of the internet that, you know, news is and will always be in demand. And it's really funny, kind of side note, I was watching a documentary while I was working this morning and it was about um, a fashion brand in the UK and how now that they have to, they, they call it fast fashion. So if they see a celeb wearing a certain thing, literally within a week, they can pump out all of these looks and get it on the website done. And I feel like that's very similar to the news as well. I feel like if you're not up to date, you're not on the internet, you don't know all these things, then people are like, we need our news, we need our drama, we need all of this. Um, so what I kind of notice as well is a lot of journalists that I see that kind of work for newspapers over here, their kind of research has now gone into looking into celebrities like social media accounts as well. So they'll go back like years through their social media accounts to dig up stuff, which I always find is quite interesting because that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time. So news in itself has kind of changed as well that, you know, we've got celeb drama, you know, there's cultural news, all these kind of different things. Um, so it definitely has changed. And, you know, it is kind of sad about the whole print media thing. Um, but unfortunately, you know, times move on. And, you know, again, in the UK, we have a few of like the, the big newspapers that now, you know, you can access their articles online. Uh, but they do, you can kind of get like halfway through and then they'll, they'll ask you to basically pay to read the rest of it. Um, so there, you know, there is a sense of struggle there, which is really sad. Um, but I just, I, I think people would just prefer to be in bed, they wake up, they can literally look at their phone and get news, rather than having to get ready, get dressed to then go down to the shop to then get a newspaper to then wait. Again, it's in demand. So you literally can hold your phone and get news like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you haven't you you haven't quite gone into the future tense, right? So I should know. Mm -mm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I I think it's very interesting, you know, that news kind of started off with thought leaders, and it kind of makes sense at that time that it started off with a lot of thought leaders because education was rare and expensive and something for the privileged few. So obviously only a few could be able to mm -hmm. kind of have enough information and the ability to then coalesce it and then write about it and then access someone who had a printing press to get that information out. So it was very much a few people, um, you know, kind of giving their perspective. And that was the world, the, the lens through which the news was viewed. Um, which is highly skewed, even if, even if, you know, you have people who might be very, you know, communally minded or, um, you know, trying to be even handed. Um, in the end, you know, I, it, it, it's really clear that it was like, um, what was I going to say here? It's like, uh, I'm trying to find the, yeah, so at first it was kind of, the news was for people to know what was going on. Like we were talking about like the civil war and, and stuff. People wanted to just know what was happening, right? Because news in that case, either would show up when you got a letter, you know, from someone however many weeks late after the fact, and, you know, probably, hopefully the person was still alive. Um, but that, you know, that the immediate person that you knew next to you was the entire scope you had really for, the way you viewed your world and the information you had. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, yeah, the idea that now in this modern era, because news has become, you know, so fragmented, right? People get their news from all these different places, mm. um, you know, and as you said, because it can look so legitimate, they might be reading something, you know, that's like aliens landed in Area 51. And now everybody's like looking at that and thinking that is the most important news. Yeah. Um, so I, I just find it really interesting how, um, you know, before, you know, I really think, again, it was the lack of access that made uh, made the news so skewed. But now it's because there is such infinite access. And it's and I think it's that when you have the plethora of choice, um, you know, choice paralysis, when you have too much stuff to look at, you just start looking at, okay, who's directly next to me? Who do I like? And what is their opinion on this? And that is how I'm going to take my facts. That's what I'm going to interpret as fact um you know i think that's very interesting uh that when you have both too little availability and too much availability you end up having a lot of the same um 
response, human beings. Um, it's really when you get in that sweet spot of just enough available and just enough curiosity that, um, you know, you get, you get a kind of balanced, more or less, um, you know, news cycle where, you know, you spend the $3 for the newspaper or the 75 cents or whatever it is for the newspaper and you get it. And so the newspaper is exchanging and it's like, there's a balance now, right? There's a balance in that case. But when, when, when it goes out of balance, the quality of the news also goes out of balance. Yeah. Um, as far as, you know, when the access becomes so extreme on either end. Um, so, yeah, so now it, it's, we find that you're going back to the same. Very few people have the ability to access and read, you know, yeah. news from more, let's say, we'll say more reputable because, you know, they have a longer history of um, accessing and giving news and trying to have some kind of journalistic integrity. And maybe, you know, if it's a major, you know, New York newspaper, um, you know, having having the kind of a, set, a standard that people can expect. Um, now that's become, again, a luxury. So to get that kind of balanced news or that kind of um, access, uh, it's kind of, again, becoming only the few can go and, you know, uh, it's very strange how much access in the too much or the too little ends up creating the same situation over again. Um, I like what you said about, um, and I won't get into it, um, AI and you know fact checking and all that stuff. Um, we see it now where there's certain apps that will tell you you know this particular um, news site tends to do uh, more tabloid type news. Their their stuff isn't really fact checked or balanced, and this one tends to be more balanced fact based news. Um, and then you know we can extrapolate from there, and I'm sure you'll get into that. Um, all the great things that can happen. And my last point is just that what we're seeing right now I think is this is an absolute need for a new standard right because okay. as Jess mentioned the fact that you know we treat our news like we treat fast fashion it's it's it, it was at one point about wanting to know what's going on and just be informed um, but it's become kind of we want to know what drama is going on um, mm -hmm. yeah. which is very different um, yeah so I think also now what we're seeing is there's just so much more vigilante news, yeah. meaning, you know, people come in and they just start, you know, saying their opinion and, you know, this is what it is and they can galvanize movements. Sometimes they're on the side of actual progress and good things. And other times it's, you know, very extreme um, and not safe ideology. So um, we are definitely in this modern era in need of some kind of established standard. And I do think apps and artificial intelligence are going to be how we can, help to spread to the entire internet that kind of um, uh, 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 fact-checking standard. But I think similar to cybersecurity, which is an issue that we've experienced from, you know, the 90s and the proliferation of the internet, um, you know, you're going to have information security. And I don't just mean, like, security as far as your data is safe. I mean security like you can trust, you know, the content that you're seeing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That is yeah. very much in the same way that you have a whole industry fighting to make sure your data stays safe and private. There's also, you know, there needs to be, if it's not an industry, it's a governmental body. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see where this conversation goes, not just yeah. here, but also in the broader yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, I could not. Oh, go ahead. We've got Ashley D commenting as well. So they hi, hi Ashley D. D. So they've said it always seems that now every news article headline is clickbait, trying to lure people in to click the news links and get those clicks and views to keep up with the other news outlets. So I feel like it's kind of always been quite clickbaity in the sense of you know headlines stand out. But I I agree with that. I think again to keep up with social media, people although certain companies want to be the one that are caught. The, spread around and shared because then it's like oh we got our news from insert company they want to get yeah. ad dollars because that is mm -hmm. now how they're how yeah. they're paying you know for their light bill mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah i i really do agree i i agree with um all of the sentiments stated here today um thank you ladies for that and thank you ashley d95 for that um they're really uh, going forward. There, there has to be a new standard set in place. And uh, as you were saying, I, I do believe that artificial intelligence uh, will will aid in that greatly. Um, to be able to not only, I mean, 
not not create brand new articles, but just be a system to to vet the articles that are out there right now, you know, based on users' preferences, which is good, but also based on just the facts. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, for the user, uh, when AI comes into play, you know, AI is wanting to get the, the, the optimal results for uh, the user. You know, if, if that is of utmost importance, which it should be in, in any AI creation, then the idea of giving the user uh, factual, fact-checked, um, legitimate information is something that should be of utmost importance. Um, I do see even the media utilizing artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, the press media, printing media to use artificial intelligence, even how they receive the news that they will be writing and reporting on. You know, I think um, there is, there is great, uh, there is just a lot of um, excitement around, you know, slanting certain news stories to, to be uh, fitting of a certain narrative as opposed to another narrative. And I, I think that is something that will, you know, be around as long as print journalism is around. But I also do believe that there are um, print journalists out there and print media out there that really does strive to just give you the, the facts as the facts are, which yeah. is no matter where it's coming from, it's just actually the truth, um, which is something I believe hopefully in the future, that is what journalistic integrity looks like in the age of technology and the age of you are so readily and easily um, absorbing everything around you that um, that may be how the new standard for journalistic integrity looks. Um, utilizing technology, utilizing artificial intelligence to be that, that one more level of vetting uh, all of the information that you are receiving. Um, I also do believe we spoke about this on Monday. I, I feel that it just is more efficient. It saves time. And, and it really does save you from having to mislearn information, which I think on a global scale is, is absolutely of value. It's of value in a different kind of way. You know, I, I do believe, you know, people, there, there is value in time, there is value in money, but there is also value in knowledge. And I do believe there will be a whole different kind of currency um, in how we, we absorb and how we, we come across knowledge that is put out there. And I do believe with the with utilizing artificial intelligence, it can be done in a way that is uh, just and fair and something that, you know, everyone can get the same kind of news, not, not based on any kind of socioeconomic status, but it's just the fact that everyone should have the right to uh, what is correct knowledge, you know, what is just factual. Okay. Um, yeah, how do you ladies see the future of AI in, in the idea of print journalism? Mm -hmm. um, also your AI, oh, sorry, just also even on a more surfacey level, your AI knows the kind of news stories that maybe you gravitate to more. Maybe you are extremely interested in science. Maybe you are extremely interested in fashion. Maybe you are extremely interested in international business or logistics and transportation, what that looks like uh, in, in terms of, have there been any articles lately about said topic that I'm really interested in? Um, I, that's also really nice if your AI just has it ready for, for, for you to either read yourself or read it to you as you're getting ready to go about your day or in your car or on your phone or just, just any, any part of the day to still have the knowledge readily available for you to consume, but I mean, it's just touchless. It's just, oh, I do want to hear that. Yes, I, I can, I have time now. So please read it to me, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you ladies see artificial mm -hmm. intelligence coming into the world of print journalism or just media, print media mm -hmm. in general? So I think you've kind of touched on two of my main points that I had. And one of my first one was to filter through the fake news. 
Um, as you both have said, you know, that is a big issue that we currently are in. You know, the internet is a big, big place. Um, a lot of people have, you know, access to, you know, write stuff on there, put this out. So, you know, that is the worry sometimes. You know, I speak to family, friends, and they're like, oh, did you hear about this? And I'm like, no, I didn't. But could you tell me more? And then they like send me the link. And I'm like, that doesn't doesn't look credible. And who else has seen this? Like, what else is going on? And I think that's really important as well, you know, in the current times that we're living in, you know, it's a crazy world at the moment. And I think we all need to sort of know what's going on and sort of actually know the truth. Um, because I think a lot of people right now don't feel like they actually know what's really going on in their countries. Again, I can only kind of speak for the UK in that sense. Um, but yeah, filtering fake news. Again, you know, AI, we speak about bias quite a lot on here. Um, and I feel like that's where AI is going to come in, that it can produce, you know, unbiased content. Um, obviously, you know, if a person isn't giving the biased opinion to it, but you know, if it's looking through these different articles, etc, and it's getting the correct data, then you know, I think it will be cool to actually have news that we can kind of trust that it's just unbiased. We can kind of read it for what it is and make our own minds about it. Um, another one that you kind of touched on, Paula, was kind of using the customer relationship data. So sort of not only in the sense of like your own AI, like it knowing your preferences, but print media companies as well. You know, it, it knows its customers. So therefore, it can kind of have a service potentially where it could customize direct, you know, mailings, catalogs, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So it's tailoring the content to the preferences of the individual customers. I feel like that would be a really cool way to go. Um, you know, you're keeping the companies alive, but again, you're sort of making it that more personal experience for every single person. Yeah. That, that's great. I never even thought about that last, that last facet you put in there mm. about the print media companies actually doing that, you know, like utilizing uh, it, yeah them actually utilizing artificial intelligence instead of the AI having to do all of the work yeah. um, through through the user and and it being basically like another user and having to to filter through, but actually having the the print media company actually, oh, wow, that's yeah. great. Yeah, and then my last one was just helping these journalists do their research. So again, we were kind of speaking on Monday about do you, would you rather, you know, look for an article, read it yourself, or would you rather an AI do it all for you? So again, imagine yeah. just a journalist being able to sort of get all the, the, the content, and then they're able to then write the article from that. So basically, they don't have to do all the, the long, the, the work, the effectively. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's so good. That's so good. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, shoot, there's not that much that I can say, because so much of what has been said um, is so excellent, you know, yeah, AI helping to fact check, um, you know, on all sides of, mm -hmm. of the consumption production uh, for the news industry, um, mm -hmm. you know, and um, what else did I have on here? I think one of the, one of the things that, um, you know, it's a conversation that has had a lot as far as uh, data, data, whatever. Um, uh, but in tech where it's like, okay, so what is the, there needs to be a standard for data, data that is, um, that it can kind of be industry wide to allow for this kind of specifically it was like the internet of things, but to allow, you know, there to be this massive interconnectedness across all of, um, you know, technology, the industry, uh, devices, appliances, that kind of thing. Um, but when I think about it, it's like one of the biggest things is there's going to have to be now, I know that it won't necessarily be absolutely perfect, but in the same way that organizations like the UN have things like the Universal Bill of Rights, right, which is just these are what human rights are. And regardless of what country you're in, these are the things that need to be upheld and respected. And you'll be considered, you know, a great upholder of human rights if you acknowledge these and support these and enforce these versus you know if you don't and then you don't get you're not you're not considered a human right you're you're a human rights abuser mm -hmm. well in a similar way i think when it comes to truth 
truth needs to be seen in some ways as a human right, that we have a right to access verified information, yeah. facts. That's it, yeah. And, yeah. you know, that um, there has to be a standard that is established for what it means to be, uh, to exercise good journalism, proper journalism, true yeah. journalism, um, you know, and for there to be, at the very least, for it to be a standard. Um, it might be something that, you know, again, an organization like the UN would, would be involved in. I know that they do on some level track the freedom of the press in different places, and I think that's great. But it'd be very interesting if also within th that discussion, um, topics like, you know, um, how the veracity of news, um, you know, how, off, how much of a country's particular news um, media is, you know, based on fact and sourcing. Um, that isn't just, you know, one made up source to another made up source to another made up source. Um, you know, it just, it'd be interesting to see if, if obviously what you don't want to do is control the media. You don't want to control yeah. press. And that's not what I'm advocating for by any means. But just the idea that there is a standard for what it means to have truth. You know, maybe that means that you're, you need at least this many, these many verifi verifiable sources that are in the particular space you're talking about. Or you need, um, you know, this many... Uh, uh, you know, bits of, you know, you you researched for this long in order to get this much fact or whatever. But I just think it. I think one of the things that, especially when we move in the future, and we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about technology. Um, and as we mentioned before, you know, this this the advent of deep fakes, where something can look extremely legitimate. You know, again, it doesn't take much to get a really um, great news site right, to aesthetically for it to look very legitimate, what matters is the content or the quality that goes into it. Um, you know, you can have a great bottle and call it wine, but if there's juice inside it, it's just not wine. Um, <laughs> and so in the same way, I think, you know, it'd be interesting when, when we're talking about the news and we're talking about, especially in the age of technology that allows for very sophisticated um, misinformation, uh, coming up with this idea of what does it mean to have a global global standard for truth. Yeah. Now, again, you know, that has to bear in mind the nuance of multiple perspectives, political leanings, all of those things. But I do think when we're talking about the future, things like that should be considered, um, you know, even if it's just each country has their own, but just something that will allow for, um, you know, outside of controlling media like, I'm not talking censorship like, you know, you mm -hmm. had in certain nations, and we're talking about that. Just the idea of being able to have some trust and faith in your media and know that it might not just be, you know, satire at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think it's really important. I think it's important to upholding rule of law, um, to the safekeeping of citizens' rights, right? You know, if, if, an, if, a, if, we get to the point where we can't believe something is true or not. What happens when we're told about rights, human rights being violated? You know, do we even believe it? Right? Can we support it? Um, so it, it's very important for that to happen. And I do believe that AI is very much um, a great um, uh, uh, tool, assistant, assist to to not only gathering factual information, but being able to read, disseminate, and, and recognize it. Um, artificial yeah. intelligence really is the way you enhance the experience of reading news. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, through all of these ideas, even thinking about AI possibly having a service to produce their own news. You understand, like, it's its own news uh, yeah. based on, you know, whatever news publication would want to partner with said AI, or even if AI just was just a constant learner, constantly and reading news articles that are factual and have already been vetted through its own system, in turn, <coughs> bless, bless you, you. Me. the Zoom type, <laughs> um, just in, in turn actually producing articles based off of more factual yeah. articles that it has already absorbed, learned from, and is trying to maybe say it in that a being different said, way. Paula, just a point on that, because I know people will hear that and they're going, okay, well, if you, you know, the AI is giving you news, you know, it's really important when you talk about any technology actually producing news. Um, again, the same way we say when it comes to producing services that AI provides, you need a diverse 
um, series of inputs. You need proper yes. oversight and stuff like that. So, yes. you know, because tech companies right now are in deep trouble because they have allowed for misinformation. Um, mm. You know, and I know that that's one of the things that people watching this will be asking. It's like, okay, you're saying it's the answer, but we've seen it actually very much lead to, you know, influences in elections and misinformation on a broad scale for populations and, you know, therefore kind of manipulating um, politics in important places. So, you know, when we talk about a standard, it's also about establishing things like governing bodies that regulate, you know, creating yeah. these kinds of things so that there is there is a common sense, universal, true, um, you know, evaluation and consequence for mm -hmm. news put out by whether it's a tech company or it's individual organizations, you know, with people mm -hmm. specifically releasing the, the content, you know. So I just, because you bring that up and because I, I kind of pulled that into the conversation a little more, I just wanted to um, specify that, mm -hmm. you know, even as we make these suggestions, it's really about, again, you still have to have a governing body um, mm -hmm. that takes seriously the impact that they have um, and that it's not, uh, it's not something that you can just um, say, oh, yeah, 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 we put up news and we give you what you want. Because sometimes giving people only what they want is how you lead to manipulation, mm -hmm. right? Because the truth is truth doesn't always make us happy. Facts yeah. don't always, you know, um, entertain or spur excitement or, you know, so when we talk about things like giving people news that is, you know, maybe geared towards their interest on some level, that's great. But on another level that risks things like, again, misinformation, um, you know, a very uninformed populace because they've had their heads in one spot for so long True. without actually having. So on some level it might, there might even be things like, you know, there needs to be a certain broad, you know, the standard might look like having things, um, where you say, you know, on a certain level, you need to have from these four or five areas, almost like when we talk about things like the, um, not the table of contents, but uh, like the food pyramid, you know, the idea of, you know, a healthy diet of food has this, 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 just general basic nutritional elements, right? Mm -hmm. Well, information is a kind of nutrition, nutrition, it's a kind of way that you enrich yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, even if it's, you know, not dogmatically adhered to, but just a standard that's created with that says, in order to have a balanced opinion, you know, you need to have these different kinds of information feeding in to make sure that you're actually um, associating with, you know, you're, you're getting the proper perspective and you're able to develop what your own opinion is based on fact. And you see things like that, you know, what I'm talking about, it's not novel. You see that when it comes to like peer reviews for scientific papers where, you know, you're going to have to go through, you know, a series of different, um, you know, uh, uh, question and answer and, and, and people fact checking and being able to verify your work. And, you know, just you don't just get to put it out there, say, hey, this is a thing I learned or this is a new scientific discovery without there being some level of, you know, you've been challenged on it to see that it still stands. Um, and mm -hmm. so we know that the average person is not going to do that. You know, the average consumer of news. But the idea is that these people would be able to know, uh, you know, again, no one's forcing food down our throat. No one's forced to be a vegetarian or a vegan, hopefully. Um, you know, no one's forced to eat meat, hopefully. But the point is that we all understand you need a certain amount of protein, you need a certain amount of, you know, calcium. And, and, and so we can make informed decisions on what works for us. So I think things like that kind of being normalized where it's like you need a certain amount of this information, a certain amount of that information just to be, you know, a healthy news citizen. Um, you yeah. know, things like that are really are how we change um, society from being kind of going back to the original days where only a few had the information and were educated enough to make the decision um, to now, again, you know, everyone has access, um, you know, Going to the corner store is not what we do anymore for our news, but it's this idea of we all go to places we can trust for news. Yeah. Wow. Well said. Well said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that seems like the perfect way to to let everyone know at home who is viewing that you know if if you 
are curious as to, you know, what the future of, of print journalism and print media look like, possibly with artificial intelligence involved in the process, um, could possibly be the next coder of these programs that, that could, you know, be changing of the industry in such a positive way of, of the new standard. You know, uh, speaking about a new standard, I think uh, as times change, there needs to be things that that consider the unique circumstances presented during uh, said times. So, you know, in, in creating a new standard and a new set of rules to play by uh, and, and uh, keeping in mind journalistic integrity and also what does that look like with, with being introduced to so many different kinds of press outlets and news outlets and things that say they're news outlets, but really it's just a blog that looks very official. <laughs> you know, um, what does that look like for the future? But, um, you know, I'm optimistic that the idea of integrity and the facts and the truth will prevail uh, above all else. And um, because I believe at the end of the day, we, we all want the truth you know, and facts and it to be presented in a way that, you know, is easily accessible and available to everyone. And, you know, if, if you're thinking about possibly creating that program or, or working towards what that looks like and uh, you do see AI being a part of the conversation and in changing, uh, you can code it for yourself. And I know you're wondering, how can I learn to code for AI? I know that's the question that came up throughout this, this whole episode, and I, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> you can go to argon.com forward slash vision 2020. Uh, Argon's IDE, which is our coding platform, we actually provide you with all of the educational lessons you need to learn to code for AI, as well as the area to practice your unique AI code. You can create anything. If you are a gamer, you can create games. If you are a journalist, you might want something new to, to, to write on for yourself, to store all of your articles that you are looking to research to create your own. You can code, you can make a code for all of those things that you need to get done. And you can really customize it to all of your specific preferences and needs. Once again, you can head on over to argon.com forward slash vision 2020 to do all of that. If you are curious about Argon, who we are as a company, uh, what we are about, some services and products we offer, you can also head on over to argon.com. You can also catch us on social media, on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Argon, A-I, A-R-G-H-O-N, A-I as well as some more informational and educational um, uh, videos pertaining to the world of artificial intelligence. That is over on youtube.com forward slash Argon. We also have our past episodes on our Argon AI Twitch channel. Head on over to the videos portion of our Argon AI Twitch channel and check out some past episodes. We have all different varying different subjects and on monday we do a very fun episode called flags and poles you know made up scenarios it sometimes it's the human uh is it the human way of doing things it's the, the ai with the human's help that is the most efficient way um what's really fun about that episode is there are no wrong answers and it's a great way to to get everyone involved in the conversation um tell them about it next week Next week, we're very excited about it because on Monday for our next episode of Flags and Polls, you're not going to see us. We will not be here. But guess what? Flags and Polls is still happening <gasps> because it will be with Argonne's summer intern. Yay. You will be able to get a fun educational episode of flags and poles but done by the awesome uh, argon interns and we are very excited to have them on this channel and we are very excited for you all to tune in ask questions and join along in the conversation mm -hmm. of ai hey uh, yes that episode as always will be at 3 p.m eastern standard time or 8 p.m 
British summertime. You all can still see me, correct? Yeah. You guys can yeah. see me? Yeah. Okay, great. When you, <laughs> when you were talking about the coding, you said argon.com slash vision2020, right? Yes. Okay. Argon.com forward slash vision2020. Go ahead, learn to code for AI. You have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Hey. hey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Ladies, I want to thank you so much for, for having this conversation with me uh, pertaining to print media and print journalism, uh, what it looked like in the past, how it currently is, and what a future imagined with artificial intelligence looks like. So thank you, and thank you, thank you. for those viewing at thank home. You. If you, if you want to speak to your friends about this, if you have any comments or ideas as to what it looks like, uh, where you are tuning in from, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And we still have access to these episodes and all of your comments. Uh, we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you all here for another episode on our Argon AI Twitch channel. See you all next week. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs>